Good morning. Today we are going to finish our discussion of spherulitic growth and then talk about uh, ways in which materials, polymers that are crystallized from solution or from deeply cooled melts uh, crystallize and maybe form structures that do not resemble spherulites because we kind of know that, what is this spherulite thing? Is that always what formed? I didn't think that was always what formed. No, it's not always what forms. And today we'll talk about uh, some of the other structures that do uh, form. But first, the crystallization kinetics I am not going to do this topic justice because this is a year-long course taught in only 10 weeks, but I do want to uh, refer you to page 552 of your, uh, of your book, and also there's a, a homework problem um, on this so you can have more practice. If we define the, crystal, uh, the crystallized fraction as this parameter phi sub c, and therefore the amorphous fraction as one minus phi sub c, which equals something called W of L over w, uh, w sub zero, where W of L is the uh, amorphous weight remaining at time t. And W naught is the mass of the, the initial mass of the melt. Then we can write something for phi sub c, which is 1 minus e to the minus k, which is a constant, not the Boltzmann constant, times time, times time to the n. So look at all of these compounded exponents we have here. Uh, and this is called the Avrami equation. And it has different forms depending on whether or not we have spontaneous nucleation or si simultaneous nucleation or, um, or spontaneous nucleation at different times. So whether or not all of the spherulites are crystallizing all at the same time or if they kind of happen at random times. So for spherulites with simultaneous nucleation, We have the Avrami exponent n equals 3 and k equals 4 thirds pi times n times the time rate of change of, uh, of r, where r is the radial growth rate. For example, in units of length per time. And capital N is the number of nuclei present at time t, or t, sorry, at t equals 0. We have a different equation for sporadic nucleation. And it differs in two ways. One of the ways in which it differs is that um, our Avrami exponent n is now 4. And also, k depends on the time um, uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, the rate of formation of nuclei, 4 thirds pi 
and dot are dot cubes, where n dot is the nuclei formed per uh, volume, unit volume. per unit time. Yeah. Uh, what is the significance of the N? The N is, which N? Little, little N or big N? Uh, little N, three, four. Little N is the, is the order of the rate of reaction, so a rate of formation, which is one in this case and two in this case, plus the dimensionality of the unit of which you're building the spherulite, which is a disk, which is two. So before you reset, yeah. E to the minus k to the power n, can that only be defined as the amorphous fraction? Yes. Okay, how about non spherulitic growth? So sometimes, so spherulites are what grow when you have a, a melted polymer and you cool it down, or, and, you, and, you, uh, and you cool it down relatively slowly. And this is how the film solidifies. You get uh, polymer chains that add it with equal probability anywhere along the periphery of this sphere. But you can have other scenarios which form um, either in solutions from supercooled uh, super melts, like we talked about the water that's supercooled and it doesn't uh, crystallize until you shake it. Um, and also you can have crystallites that form or, or crystalline morphologies that form when you shear a solution. So how do you make you know, fishing line or fibers uh, like Kevlar, like bulletproof vests. You think those are made of spherulites? Think again. You need strong fibers that are strong like steel, and in those cases you process the fibers by applying shear to the solution. So some types of structures that might form are what are known as uh, single crystals And they're known as single crystals, but really um, you can't totally discount the possibility that some of these chain ends are kind of loose out here. So they have a, they have a crystalline microstructure, but they're kind of like sloppy single crystals. So they're not single crystals in the same way that like sodium chloride or diamond would be a single crystal. An interesting structure that you can get under some circumstances is a, is a dendrite where instead of a process under thermodynamic control where the polymer chains add with equal probability anywhere where the, uh, where the rate of growth is slow of any of the, um, the chain or any of the, the, um, the branch ends within a spherulite, if instead the molecules diffuse around and as soon as they see a growing, a growing um, crystalline facet, they add and they don't leave. They add, they don't leave. And this structure is called a dendrite. Looks kind of like a, a little bit like a, like a tree. And this structure you might get 
if you super cool a solution where the driving force toward uh, toward crystallization is especially spring loaded because you, you because you've uh, you've super cooled the solution, but it's still a melt. Yep. Is a dendromer an example of a dendrite? A, a dendromer is not an example of a dendrite. A dendromer is a covalently bound solid that's made intentionally with covalent bonds. This is strictly a a uh, diffusion limited aggregate. These bonds here are not covalent bonds. In a dendromer, you're intentionally locking in place each structure. And also a dendromer is spherically symmetric, whereas a, whereas a dendrite, as in a, the crystalline morphology, is not spherically symmetric or not necessarily spherically symmetric. Yep. They're not covalently bonded atoms bonded by intermolecular Yeah, they're bonded. The, so, each, so each facet here could look like this. Each line here looks like this. Or something, or something like it. Single crystal, you might not always have this um, adjacent reentry or um, switchboard-like model. You might also have molecular axes parallel to the to the crystalline axis, depending on the stiffness of the polymer. You might also get these structures um, from, uh, for example, uh, semiconducting polymers, which have a rigid chain structure because they have alternating single and double bonds and because they're so rigid they tend to form structures like this. If they're really rigid then you don't get this arrangement. You get arrangements with the axis uh, parallel to the long axis of, the, of a crystallite. And then the most fun structure here is the, uh, the shish kebab structure and this forms um, under shear from solution and I'm going to do my best job not to butcher this structure. But basically you have long fibers. Then you have these lamellar structures. And then you have another disc made of, uh, made of these, these chains. And in between, you have long, uh, long uh, molecular chains. And this is, this is literally called a shish kebab. Which is the way you roast polymers on an open flame. And you get this from stirred or sheared. solutions and this forms strong fibers but only works with high molecular weight because it's hard to shear align something that has low molecular weight. It really needs to be long in order to get it to extend. And this is for example how you make like Kevlar vests fishing line anything that requires a lot of tensile strength because if you align all the polymer chains you have all of these strong CC bonds oriented along the axis of strain and that gives the material a lot of strength whereas just a solid polymer that's made of a spherulitic structure which is um, overall anisotropic there's no preferred axis of, of, you have all these strong bonds, but they're all kind of pointed in useless directions. <laughs> if you align them all, you can get all of the, uh, the strength of the, of the um, covalent bonds along the same axis. There are other structures that are non-spherulitic morphologies, but you need a special type of molecular structure. And we alluded to the concept of a block copolymer several times throughout the class. And that is taking two polymers that don't want to mix intimately, so they want to separate like oil and water because of the unfavorable delta H, 
um, but you're forcing them to intermingle by covalently linking the ends of two, uh, two groups. So these form uh, non-spherulitic morphologies as well. And a typical example of a block copolymer is uh, PS block PMMA. And typically how we write this is, is A, N, B, M. And these phase separate to form nanoscopic patterns that have a surprising degree of regularity. Now what it requires is that both polymers are, are pretty flexible. Uh, and what they do is they self-assemble into structures. So from, uh, so from low A, high B content all the way to high A, low B, because these don't have to be 50-50. You can have lots of A at, the, and at one end and lots of B um, at the other end of the, uh, of the spectrum, depending on how much monomer you add. And again, we make these by anionic polymerization under favorable circumstances, or raft, or ATRP, or tempo-mediated polymerization. Those are the techniques that we have to make block copolymers. And if you think about a cubic unit cell, The structure that, the first structure that you get, where let's say the filled parts are A and all the other space is B. This is a cubic structure. Then as you increase the fraction of A in your block copolymer chain, you get another type of structure which becomes thermodynamically favorable. And that is a hexagonal structure. Or I mean here, that is a really horrible drawing. What I mean here is to draw three cylinders at the bottom, two more cylinders in the middle so that they kind of log stack on top of each other, and then three more cylinders at the top. And this is called the hexagonal structure with uh, cylindrical microdomains. Before uh, nanoengineering and nanotechnology was a thing, people named everything micro. So these are called microdomains, even though the typical dimensions are like 10 to a few hundred nanometers. As you increase the fraction of A uh, even more, you get this uh, structure that doesn't ex doesn't persist for very uh, many weight fractions, and it's the most impossible one to draw. But for homework, I would encourage you to do a Google image search for this. I'm just going to fake it here. It is the gyroid structure. The gyroid structure is the only one that's bicontiguous. Which means that if you have repeating unit cells everywhere, you can get from anywhere in the A block 
to anywhere else in the A block without crossing through any of the B blocks. Yep. In uh, where is that cubic? Is that, uh, to verify, is that body centered cubic? Or? Yes, this is body centered cubic. And you can conversely get anywhere in the B domain from one block to the next without having to cross over any of the A domains. The final structure is where you have approximately equal amounts of both A and B. And then you get a, a uh, trace leches cake, basically. Or a supermarket cake from Vons. Or pancakes. Where you have A alternating with B, alternating with A, alternating with B. And this is called the lamellar, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, lamellar morphology. However, once we're at about 50-50, A and B, then it, inverse, it, it inverts the entire thing. So then you get the inverted. Now, inverted is a, um, is a uh, relative term. It just means that you have the gyroid structure, except that the, uh, except that the filled regions and the open regions have switched roles because now the mole fraction is reversed. And I'm not going to draw I'm not going to draw it again. The inverted hexagonal and the inverted cubic Does that make sense? Really now, since I took up too much space, high A, low B should go all the way at the end. Yep. But the, the gyroid has a pretty distinct shape. Is that uh, it's like some crazy mathematical solution that ends up taking a consistent shape where we see this bizarre structure in different combinations of polymers? We do see it in different com combinations of polymers. Yes, it's always the same kind of shape. Questions? Yep. Since you're talking about block with polymers, where do dendromers then uh, stand in this spectrum? So dendromers do not uh, form these microstructures. They can form other types of microstructures. But generally, uh, but because they're really homopolymers, they're just branched homopolymers, they don't phase separate like this. They're really like gigantic single molecules. So in order for these to happen, uh, they got to be polymers that make separate. So basically two polymers then, right? All they have to be is two different polymers that, both, that are both um, uh, um, Globular, or they're both, they don't have, um, uh, they don't, ha they're not especially rigid. They form random coil, more or less random coils. Uh, those, and they have to be, they have to be different. I mean, obviously, otherwise they wouldn't be a block of polymer. But they can't be like polystyrene and polyalpha methyl styrene or, or something. Um, Maybe they could be, but it wouldn't work as well. If they're chemically different, it's better, yeah. Regarding notation, I noticed here in the, uh, the monomer notation, we have it looking like uh, A and B are actually directly bonded together. But the morphology seems to demonstrate that it's more of a mixture of the two of them. Are you mixing like a amorphous polystyrene and amorphous DNA and getting the structure, or are they linked covalently in a, in a common sense, like alternating or something? They are not alternating. It's all A's, all B's. And what happens over here is that 
you have a small A chain and a longer B chain like this. And as you equalize the lengths of the different blocks, you go from cubic to hexagonal to gyroid to lamellar. That's a good question. Everyone see how this, how this kind of works? They still have to be covalently bonded in order to get this, but they can't separate indefinitely like salad dressing. But there are thermodynamically favored morphologies at specific temperatures and fractions of each, uh, <coughs> each polymer. So you can actually get a phase diagram for block copolymers that looks like a cloud point diagram. And forgive me, this is confusing notation, but what we do, but this is the way it is. Uh, this is the Flory-Huggins interaction parameter chi that we're used to. And in an ideal case, this is the monodisperse degree of polymerization x. And F sub A is the fraction of A monomers. And what we end up with is something that looks like a cloud point diagram. Cubic, hexagonal, and because I don't know how to draw, gyroid, lamellar in the center, then gyroid, hexagonal, uh, cubic, where out here at high enough uh, temperatures, remember, because the way these are plotted. Don't ask me why. The way that the cloud point diagrams for block of polymers are plotted is almost always in terms of chi, which remember is dependent on the inverse of T, which is why this whole thing is flipped. So at high enough uh, temperatures, we have the homogeneous disordered state. So if we play around with the mole fraction at a given temperature and degree of polymerization, we can go from a disordered state to a cubic state to a hexagonal state to a gyroidal state to the lamellar state and then in reverse. So we can navigate anywhere around this cloud point diagram to give us the particular block copolymer structure we want for a given application. Now what on earth could those applications be? Suppose you had a thin film of the hexagonal phase. So if you have a thin, thin film, say this is 100 nanometers, thin film of hec the hexagonal phase gives you cylindrical microdomains
And suppose that each one of these cylindrical microdomains is PMMA. And the continuous phase is polystyrene. Now, there's a particular problem um, in microprocessor technology where you want to have um, low, uh, low K dielectrics. And to get low K dielectrics, the lowest K uh, dielectric constant there is is air or vacuum. So it's helpful to have structures with regular porosity. And block copolymers give you a route to forming uh, structures with regular por uh, porosity. Um, and these are actually, block copolymers are actually used as low K dielectrics in, um, in lots of different microprocessor technologies. So IBM has tons of patents on this type of, of technologies and uh, as do other um, semiconductor manufacturers. And what's cool about PMMA is that you can etch it out by exposing it to, um, to UV light or an electron beam, you degrade it and then you can wash it out with a solvent. So now instead of cylindrical microdomains, you have, or instead of cylindrical microdomains of PMMA, you now have holes. There are holes filled with air. And this slab is now a, uh, now a low K dielectric for uh, transistors. You can also do things with lamellar dom domains. So you can also make structures that from the top down Suppose in photolithography, where you're patterning a photo polymer photoresist film on a silicon wafer, and you're trying to beat Moore's law, for example. So Moore's law says that you, uh, the pattern density doubles every 18 months or something like that. There are various different formulations of Moore's law. But suppose your photolithography equipment can only get down to um, like 50 nanometers. But suppose that you have a block copolymer and you know that block copolymer microdomains can get down to like 10 nanometers or smaller. What you can actually do is something called graphoepitaxy, where you start with a much larger size scale structure. And when you put the block copolymers in, they self-assemble to give you to double, your, double or triple uh, your pattern density. So um, we're not going to talk about this in, in detail, but suppose you have some some structure that looks like this. This is called a uh, grapho epitaxy. So here's your uh, here's your photoresist pattern. A photoresist is just a, uh, a film that is sensitive to light and you can etch, you can create patterns in it. And then you put your block copolymer film in and you can now increase the effective resolution because the block copolymer microdomains, if they're lamellar, will fill out this structure and give you a greater density of, say, lines or wires or transistors. And there are a lot of uh, cool manipulations that you can do. Um, to do this. So this is, uh, so this is your, your block copolymer within these lines defined by uh, conventional photolithography. Okay, one other type of super, supramolecular uh, microstructure that I want to talk about and then we will be done with this topic is a liquid crystalline polymer. Yeah. 
So liquid crystalline uh, polymers have a, uh, are, are polymers that incorporate a mesogenic unit. Now that means that it's floppy, floppy, uh, it has a floppy section, then a rigid section, then a floppy section, then a rigid section, and so on. And the rigid sections are called the mesogenic units. And why are they mesogenics? Because they generate mesophases in between the melt and the crystalline phases. And why do, we, why do you want liquid crystalline polymers? Because uh, you want to be able to control the pixels on your, on your HDTV and, and things like that. OK, so these are polymers with mesogenic units that give that give phases between the crystalline and melt phases. where these things are the mesogens and it's some molecular structure that's stiffer than, uh, than every other um, flexible linker. So the mesogen could be something like something that has a lot of benzene rings in it and sp2 hybridized uh, carbon atoms and then the flexible linker could be something like so this is just an example of a mesogen and an example of a flexible linker could just be polyethylene polyethylene oxide or something. And what you get are mesophases and you can have different types of mesophases but I'll just draw the two um, principal classes. This is the this is the nematic phase where you have some anisotropy, which is characterized by a vector called the director. And this has preferential alignment of chains but not preferential alignment of the mesogens between the chains. So prefer preferential alignment of chains, but not of the mesogens. And then you have a more ordered phase, which, as you can imagine, has both preferential alignment of chains and preferential alignment of the mesogens. And we call this the smectic phase. And you can have many different smectic subphases depending on the polymer, but in general they have this, uh, this director 
and they have uh, some kind of um, reproducible relationship between the, uh, some kind of regular relationship between the, uh, the mesogens. One characteristic of uh, liquid crystalline polymers is that they are birefringent, which means that they interact with, uh, with polarized light. So you can actually use these sort of as molecular polarizers, which is the basis of liquid crystal display technology, where you use an electric field to realign um, liquid crystals, but not always polymers. It could be liquid crystal and small molecules. In fact, that's probably more likely in a TV. Uh, but the, uh, the idea is if you have a tunable, um, uh, a tunable polarizer, then you can attenuate the amount of light that comes in through the color filter. And if you do that with each pixel, you get different, um, you get different uh, intensities of each pixel. Yep. Yes. There is more um, freedom than there would be in a in a melt, uh, or there's less. There's more freedom than there would be in a crystallite, but less than there would be in a in a melt. So, what you finally get as you increase the, the temperature. So as you increase the, the temperature for a, uh, a liquid crystalline polymer, you get a glass. Then you pass through the glass transition temperature. Then you get crystalline uh, material. Then you melt the crystalline material. But before you get to the melt, you have the liquid crystal phases that go uh, first smectic, then pneumatic, and then finally melt. So the liquid crystal phases exist between the uh, the TC or between the TM and the melt, so you're kind of melted but not quite, and this is the region where all of the cool liquid crystalline properties uh, are possible. Yeah. Director is just the axis along which the chains are oriented. So um, forgive me, please, for going so fast today. And the reason we're going fast is because I uh, inserted a review session for exam two, which I hope you're happy about. Um, but since that was a while ago, um, probably forgot about it. But <laughs> um, and the, the reason is because exam uh, two will be, or sorry, exam three will be uh, next week, Friday. And we'll have class on Friday, but we're missing a day on Monday. So I wanted to make sure that I got everything, because uh, there's no class on Monday because of Memorial Day. So I wanted to make sure we got everything in. Wednesday will be the last day of class for, um, uh, before exam three. Uh, and we're going to finish up the main part of the course. And week 10 will be uh, special topics um, that will not be recorded. So everybody has to, has to come to class on those days. Um, and, and, and week 10 will be kind of application. So we'll talk about polymers in, uh, in drug delivery. We'll have a, a couple of guest uh, speakers that week um, from various uh, uh, aspects of the polymer uh, community. And, um, and then we'll have the final. Any, any questions? We have, some, we have some time. Otherwise, I'm going to take the last five minutes to talk about new stuff. Yep. Yes, plus week 10. OK, I want to give you a little bit of a preview, uh, if there are no other questions. I'll give you a little bit of a preview on what we're going to start talking about on, um, on 
Monday or on, on Friday, which is the glass transition temperature and its importance in determining the, um, uh, the crystalline morphology. So we talked about the, uh, the a, a glassy polymer versus a, versus a, um, uh, a rubbery polymer, which is what we get after we uh, increase the temperature past the TG. So polymers that are below TG are in a glassy, frozen spaghetti-like morphology. But even though they're in this glassy morphology, they still have, they can still absorb more energy per unit, uh, per unit volume prior to fracture than ceramic materials. And that's because of different sub TG relaxations that can occur in these materials, even though they can't slide past each other, the bonds are still mobile. So bonds can rotate if you, if you try to, um, you know, smash a piece of plexiglass versus try to PM, which is PMMA versus smashing a piece of regular glass. Um, uh, which one is, is going to hurt more? <laughs> Well, it depends on how hard you hit it and how many times, um, but assuming you actually break it, the PMMA will hurt a lot more. It takes a lot more um, energy to break it because of these sub-TG relaxations. Then once you get to TG, uh, the TG provides enough activation energy for the polymer chains to slide past each other. So that you can, uh, so that a number of of, uh, of repeat units can slide past each other at uh, at the glass transition temperature, and then the and, and remember the TG only applies to the amorphous domains. We haven't touched the crystalline domains yet, but once you surpass the TG, the material, um, if it if it uh, uh, becomes becomes more deformable, um, and in fact, if it doesn't have crystalline domains, it basically becomes a melt above the TG because there's no, there are no crystalline domains holding the thing together. And from there, we get uh, all of the rich polymer mechanical properties um, like uh, toughness and viscoelasticity that we're going to talk about on Wednesday next week. And that'll be the last like official topic of the class. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll see you on Friday.